Thank you so much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak in this incredible venue. Every time I come to Scotland, I feel at home. I, this country is fantastic. My fellow um, citizen, um, Mark Carney, just said recently, the money is there. But I think that as uh, any Scottish woman in the, um, around here will say, now we need to walk the wool, meaning developing the strings of admissibility for this financial support that will be available. I also want to uh, thank Dr. Carvalho de Andrade for his opening remarks and look forward to Professor Esti's comments. It is a privilege to share this stage with such accomplished individuals fighting for a better alignment of finances with our climate change and commitments. I have the honor to preside over the Parliamericans Parliamentary Network on Climate Change. Parliamericas is the institution that promotes dialogue and, di and parliamentary diplomacy among 35 parliaments of the Americas and the Caribbeans, with a focus on open parliament, gender equality, and climate change. Our mission as a network is to strengthen the role of parliaments in aligning the national climate action with Paris Agreement and its nationally determined contributions. Me too, I am optimistic, not for the same reasons that Dr. Carvalho, but because I am an environmental engineer teaching for over 42 years in academics, and I never seen in my whole life so many groups wanting a change a transformation in the way we consume, in the way we measure our prosperity. As the previous speaker said, GDP should be more green DP. And so it starts by knowing how to measure a problem. Engineers, we say, if we cannot measure the problem, how are we going to solve it? I would like to highlight recent initiative from the Americas before just diving into this very, very heavy topic about finances and climate. In 2021, the Chamber of Deputies of Mexico steered technical tools to integrate sustainable development within national budget process. This includes a public report that links proposed expenses with sustainable development goals and a tool to guide standing committees in identifying the level of alignment between the proposed programs and the SDGs. When I joined the Senate, I became the president of the Committee of Energy, Environment and Natural Resources and realized that the power was more in the financial committee. So now I am a member of the financial committee because we need to seek accountability and know where the money is allocated after politicians have made pledges. This is just one of the good practice examples put forward in the publication that is called Parliaments and the Paris Agreement, that is written in three languages, Spanish, French, and English, and is available to everybody. And this was jointly developed by Parlamericas, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, GLOVE, and InterParis. This publication offers advice on how parliaments can support action plans. Parlamericas has also developed another great tool that maps the strategies adopted by members to address specific environmental and climate change topics. Please visit Parlamericas' website. It's sad that our UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance, Mr. Mark Carney, couldn't be present. He deserves all the gratitude, and we Canadians are proud of him. He increased the ambition on climate action in the financial world. Several positive announcements in this first week of COP26 are indeed encouraging, including announcement of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero commitment of over 130 trillion of private capital to transform the economy towards the net zero, and that 20 countries, including mine, Canada, promise that they will shift public finances away from fossil fuels before the end of 2022. That's tomorrow. Mr. Carney has previously said that it is now time to start fiddling with the wonky plumbing of the financial world. I could not agree more, and I will add that 
Now is the time to transform these general and global statements into bold action that is critically needed. Legislation is necessary to compel us beyond the voluntary actions that has been taken up today. Otherwise, we won't be moving forward in the desired direction. Voluntary actions under the leadership of the Task Force for the Climate Disclosure have unfortunately not delivered change at the scale nor at the speed that we need. The reason why is very simple. Despite ever-expanding data and disclosures, there isn't enough legal and commercial pressure or incentive for business and investors to act. In November 2020, a HSBC survey of 2,000 investors found that only 10% view climate disclosure as a relevant source of information. Isn't that telling? This sober observation is supported by the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program, whose director recently wrote that climate risk management can make little or no contribution to alignment with climate outcomes. According to them, to attain a real change, action has to move beyond disclosure of climate-related financial risk towards proactive interventions from engaging the world's emitters to set greenhouse gas reduction targets that are sufficiently ambitious, credible, and science-based to invest in. Financing and helping enable the breakthrough technologies that exist also today and business models of the future. Moreover, a focus on the role of regulators as Fiduciary duty and other fiscal incentive is imperative to understand how we might reset the rules to develop a more regenerative and resilient circular economy. We ought to adopt a macroprudential precautionary approach. And if you are wondering what macroprudential means, is the study of the health, soundness, and vulnerabilities of a financial system to identify systemic risk. It also looks at the interconnectedness of financial system participants and how risk can be transmitted through the whole system via these financial linkages. This must mitigate climate change risk to the financial system but also mitigates the damage that the present financial system inflicts in the environment. We must focus on legislative innovation applied to the existing ways of financing, most notably to the fossil fuel sector, which define and heavily influence our current situation. This new precautionary approach is an injunction to act and to try efficient interventions because Continued inaction is our greatest danger. Too many of the largest investors still operate under an interpretation of fiduciary duties where social and environmental issues can be considered only if they measurably reduce financial risk or increase monetary returns. Banks which are critically influential actors in any economy, currently have few or none regulatory or commercial incentive to lend the way and reduce to lead the way and reduce the carbon footprint of their loan portfolios. Legislative action is then necessary, dear colleagues. We must enact a precautionary approach that requires financial activities to align with and support achieving climate commitments. This must minimally include supporting the transition to a net zero economy in a manner consistent with a science-based pathway to limit the temperature to increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Avoiding a lock-in of fossil fuel assets that bring harm to humans, society, environment, including biodiversity loss and species extinction. And three, making substantial positive environmental impacts based 
on life cycle consideration of developing projects, but also mitigating negative impacts caused by polluting emissions from assets that are not owned or controlled by the organizations reporting their emissions. Then, it appears urgent to make banks, capital, reserve, and pension funds funding requirements a direct function of the carbon exposure of their portfolios and specify that the fiduciary duties of corporate directors, pension plans administrators, and other fiduciaries require that, that their investment must align with climate commitments. This must start with national public finances, namely with crown and government-owned corporations. The world needs more leaders that will tackle both risk with equal pressure. Protecting financial institutions from increasing climate-related risk and protecting humans and our planet from irresponsible financial decisions. Thank you very much.